Welcome to the Child Welfare Information Technology Systems Managers and Staff Webinar Series, brought to you on behalf of the Health and Human Services Administration for Children and Families, Children's Bureau. I'm Nick Moser. Today's webinar features a speaker panel from Leading Agile on how to promote strong collaborative relationships between program staff and information technology staff. While much of the content will be in the context of Agile collaboration, this presentation is designed to be a benefit to those practicing all types of IT development approaches. Today's presentation will discuss common challenges that organizations face in both Agile and traditional project management settings, a brief overview of Agile, and various ways that Agile can lend itself to increase collaboration. With that, I will now introduce Nathan Hummel, who's going to take it away and tell us more about Agile. Hi, everyone. Thanks, Nick. I appreciate it. Uh, and so, like Nick was saying, uh, we're here today to talk to you a little bit about uh, IT business collaboration um, and how to build out those relationships, um, how to interact uh, across those two different departments. Um, and I know that, you know, a lot of the different states that we have on the call uh, may be practicing Agile, some may be practicing those tradi that traditional model. Um, and so we're going to talk about IT business collaboration from the perspective of, of both of those models, um, but we're also going to talk about, you know, to Nick's point, how Agile can, can lend itself um, to uh, fostering improved relationships and, and collaboration between IT and business groups. So with that, um, our agenda for today is um, we're going to be going over the importance of effective collaboration. Um, we're going to be talking through common challenges. Uh, we'll talk about collaboration and feedback loops. We'll then move into Agile and collaboration. Uh, from there, we'll move into business agility in the larger organization. Uh, and we'll finish up today with a little bit of a, a question and answer session. Um, as we're going through today's session, uh, if you have questions, um, I know Nick has, has told me that there's a, a chat box that you can uh, type questions into. So we encourage you to use that and uh, think about different questions that you might have as we're going through this, this presentation. Uh, so brief introductions, like I said, uh, my name is Nathan Hummel. Um, I'm an Agile consultant with Leading Agile. Um, Leading Agile is a company dedicated to helping larger organizations um, solve complex business problems. And so for the last two and a half years, we've been working with the states um, in hopes to drive greater business agility uh, within those organizations. Uh, and so we have a technical assistance program that, uh, you know, for the last two and a half years, we've, we've been doing that through. Um, we also have Jim Cundiff on the line who's going to be presenting uh, alongside me. Um, Jim's our, our president and uh, has a wealth of experience both within the consulting side um, but also on the project management um, and Agile side as well. Um, along with that, we have Michael Colchinato who is an uh, Agile and management consultant for us at Leading Agile. Um, and Michael actually brings a really unique perspective in that um, Michael was one of the, the folks who helped to originate this this technical assistance program that we've been able to um, help states with, you know, as I mentioned, over the past two and a half years. Um, and so he, again, he really brings a, a wealth of knowledge, both from the consulting side, but also from the perspective of his history with the states. Um, and then we also have a guest appearance uh, from one of our uh, more esteemed colleagues here at Leading Agile, Dave Pryor, who uh, is very well known within the Agile community, and, and he's going to be giving us um, a brief overview of what Agile is. Uh, Dave's a certified Scrum trainer, uh, and, and he actually sits on the, the board of approvers for Scrum trainers. Um, and so, like I said, Dave is, Dave is very well respected um, as a speaker, as, as an educator, um, and as a pra practitioner in the Agile space. And so he'll, he'll be uh, uh, leading us through a video today. Um, so our target out outcomes for today, um, obviously we want to develop shared understanding so what is effective communication? Why is it important here to us at the States? Um, how can we utilize this information? Uh, we want to integrate knowledge and skills. So uh, today as we go through the presentation, we'll talk a lot about integrating business knowledge uh, with technical expertise or technical skills. And so we want to make sure that wherever possible within our communication and collaboration schemes, that we're fostering that relationship and that we're leveraging both those, those, that business knowledge and, and the technical expertise or technical skills. 
Um, we're also going to talk about our, another outcome. Uh, we want to analyze and evaluate our current processes. So as we go through the presentation, I mentioned this earlier, um, I encourage you to think about ways that um, a lot of this, this stuff that we're talking about might be different than what you're doing today. Um, because again, the, the first step in, in kind of um, get, getting to a place where you can change is, is just creating awareness. And so if we can create awareness around um, so, some ways that our processes might be different from some of the things that we're talking about today, um, then we, maybe we might be able to think of, start thinking about how we can improve them. Again, we want to identify opportunities uh, for improvement. Um, so as we're going through this, try to think about some ways that uh, some of the things might be different from what we're talking about um, and think about how you might be able to improve. Um, and again, we want to develop a new perspective on, on business and IT partnership. Um, and so, you know, we want to think about different ways that we might be able to utilize those things going forward. I know we talked about that there may be a lot of states who are moving towards an agile direction, right? And so what does that, that new partnership look like now that um, IT have, may have switched um, some of their processes? So those are some things that, um, you know, I encourage you to think about as we go throughout today's call. Um, and with that, um, we're going to be rolling into the section on the importance of effective collaboration led by our, our president, Jim Cundiff. Hello, everyone. Uh, first, I'd like to just uh, give you kind of a brief overview of how we look at, at business agility. And you're going to hear this quite a bit over the next hour and 15 minutes or so. Uh, but we're, going to, we're doing that in part just to reemphasize uh, how we define business agility. So for us, business agility is about improving business outcomes. It's about focusing on user needs, maximizing the flow of value to your customers or your consumers. It's about connecting your strategy with execution, trying to minimize waste, improve effectiveness. It's about designing a way of working using proven organizational change management design principles. It's also utilizing some of the agile practices uh, to help you to meet some of your particular business and capability needs. Uh, it's about having the ability to measure progress, uh, to make evidence-based economic or other types of trade-offs with minimal disruptions. It's about aligning business capabilities to technology and to people while maximizing your ability to put more value into the market faster and improve your quality. So with that, and you'll hear that quite a bit from us, um, I, I want to emphasize and, and make certain that you understand that this Changing the way you work uh, to a more uh, business agile frame framework is going to take you some time. Uh, not only is it going to need some executive buy-in, but you're also going to have to allow some space for information, education, for training, for knowledge share around a new way of working. So how you think about all of this in the context of improved organizational design, uh, discussing how you can organize around the work instead of organizing around your roles and responsibilities, and exploring how to plan, manage, and track progress is, is critically important to you being able to adopt uh, this way of working. So you're going to hear that a lot in the next uh, hour and a half. When you're talking about uh, leadership or key stakeholders and you're looking at your project success, you're going to engage with all of these Entities, So from procurement to finance to executive leadership, um, even to users, user experiences. And your leadership, your key stakeholders, they might want this business agility, uh, but they're not going to buy into some emergent process. So they're going to need to know what's in it for them. They're going to require line of sight to how these improvements are going to be made. They're also going to want to know how the process is going to unfold and how you're going to measure progress. So you're going to have to be able to justify the economics uh, and the value proposition of all of this to, to your mission. So when we're talking about the importance of collaboration, and we'll talk about this a little bit, uh, a little bit later as well, but as you're going through your key stakeholders and determining uh, the individuals that are important to the relationship and how you communicate, manage expectations, and such, you're going to go through some type of a process where you're actually going to map out a visual model. You may call that influence mapping, or you may call that stakeholder mapping. And we'll talk about that a little bit later. But it's important to, uh, to mention now because these key people, the people that are important to the success, success of the project, 
are the first entities that you're going to need to identify. So when we're talking about communication and collaboration, it's important to understand um, the difference between the two and how they operate together. When you're talking about communication, most of us know it's an exchange of information. We're trying to help someone to understand or communicate a message. Uh, with collaboration, we're certainly exchanging information, but there are other things involved with this too. And the goal is a little bit different because we're actually trying to advance some stated mission, uh, some product, some effort. So what, what the two share in a common is certainly the exchange of information. The collaboration adds the goal of moving some type of collaborative product forward, some type of mission forward, some type of effort forward. So in the world of Agile, collaboration and communication are two concepts that are really designed to work together. I've heard a lot of uh, Agilists talk about collaborating with their colleagues through instant messenger or email or video chat, when what they really mean is they're using those platforms to communicate with each other. Communication's always been a component of the workforce. It simply refers to how we connect with each other through uh, some venue, whether it be electronic uh, or face-to-face. -face. And communication is certainly about sharing knowledge. The difference comes in with collaboration is really a process of working together, working with another person, working with a group of people to achieve a stated end goal. So when you collaborate with someone, you're aligning the work and behavior to theirs to accomplish typically something very important. So collaboration involves more than just talking. It involves actually connecting with people, preferably face-to-face. -face. Thanks, Jim. So with that, we'll hand it over to uh, Michael Fortunato, who's going to tell us about common challenges that he's seen in his experiences with the state. So good afternoon, everyone. As Nathan said, my name is Michael Fortunato. I was uh, lead consultant along with Jim Cundiff uh, from, from the beginning of the technical assistance program. We started in about uh, early 2017, and uh, I was actually involved with the program until mid to late last year. Uh, we want to give you a little bit of background and history on uh, the information I'm about to give you about common strengths and challenges that we saw. Uh, we visited uh, we, we, we've worked with over 20 states, and we've conducted uh, upwards of 30, 30-something 30 uh, actual site visits on st uh, at states. And each of those site visits has been anywhere from uh, two to three days. Uh, in the beginning, uh, the program was fairly straightforward and simple. It was more of a knowledge transfer uh, type of offering. But as we learned more uh, about the states, and we met more states and met more of the people at the states and began to understand that there were some common uh, patterns, there were some common strengths and challenges uh, that all states faced, and that there was a need for uh, not just agile training or any type of knowledge transfer, but a need to help build uh, those bridges between uh, IT and the program to Help, help create a partnership. So our partnership was with the states and with the federal analyst who was working with the states. And the way that we went about learning uh, more about the states so that we could better help them was through uh, several steps. The first one was a uh, due diligence period where we collaborated with the state uh, virtually shared information so that when we came on site, we already had a sense of how the state was structured uh, whether it was regional, county administered, whatever, whatever it might be. Uh, the history of the state in terms of large system development, um, any legal or other uh, federal uh, supervision that may be going on, uh, to get a little background uh, there before we arrived on site. We then do what we call discovery sessions. We do short interviews with individuals and small groups uh, to find out how the day-to-day -day worked and uh, what, what uh, the, a day in the life was like for the different roles uh, within within the agency. Um, during the site visits themselves, we cut we conducted workshops where we would do brainstorming on the actual strengths and challenges. Uh, we would look for and talk about common functional dysfunctional patterns, uh, and we would do what we call an agile level set where we would simply talk about well, uh, what are what is agile? What does it mean? What are the principles? Uh, and, and how does it really work? 
Uh, the key to all of this was that we discovered pretty early on that we had to take a change management approach and we needed the states to see the, the wide ranging implications of, of building that IT and business uh, partnership and that shared risk model. Uh, it had to be more of a comprehensive type of approach. It's not, it's not, uh, you can't simply, uh, train uh, a group of, of people in Scrum and then expect the process to take off. You also cannot replace, to, expect to replace wholesale any of your traditional waterfall methods that are out there. Uh, those things need to work together. And, uh, so at, at the culmination of this, we would put together a site visit report which, uh, basically stated, you know, what we had learned. We would then validate that with the state to make sure that everything that we had uh, put in the report was was accurate. And so what I'm going to share with you now is is kind of a, a summary of the things that we learned uh, throughout all of those site visits and all of the states, all the workshops, discovery sessions, uh, the change management conversations, the executive leadership uh, conversations that we had throughout all the states. So what do we typically see, and and uh, what what are some of the common uh, strengths and challenges that we see in states. Well, on the plus side, you know, it was, it was uh, refreshing and inspiring to, to know that, that everyone that we worked with was, uh, really working toward a common goal, protecting children and families. It's a, it's a, a very uh, important thing to do. And that, you know, in most cases, there were some serious constraints that were impacting, uh, their ability to do that, both from a technical perspective and, uh, and, and from supporting the, the social workers in the field. Uh, but overall, the, everyone was enthusiastic and gay and engaged and any, anyone who tells you that, that government simply cannot change has never worked with any of the child welfare agencies that we worked with. We had very positive working relationships and we found for the most part, there was a positive working relationship uh, between the different uh, parts of the organization. Uh, that being said, there was always, uh, you know, it was not perfect. Uh, there was uh, quite a bit of subject matter expertise. Uh, in some cases, there was even agile expertise on board and a general openness to new ways of working. All of these things combined together to help build a, a successful engagement for, for us and, and for the states that we worked with. On the challenges side, uh, you know, there was, there, there, there were typically uh, a silo type of setup. So we're talking about a, a tendency to organize around efficiency, uh, as, as opposed to effectiveness. Uh, there were resource constraints, obviously budget cuts. Many states experienced budget cuts over, over the past several years, uh, both in the field and, and within technology. Uh, some oftentimes unclear communication channels around decisioning, ownership of, of certain decisions and, and how those decisions were made, uh, how information actually flowed through the organization. Uh, there was lack of a common uh, framework. When we say common framework, we mean uh, a generally agreed upon way of, of getting work done. We find that some teams would be doing some things a certain way, other teams would be doing it slightly differently. Um, and there was a, uh, a lot of, a lot of reactivity versus proactivity. And we'll talk about the reasons for why that was, but, uh, many things going on, uh, changes coming up constantly, uh, and this was causing a, a, a knee-jerk reaction in a lot of cases, uh, that reverberated across uh, everything that was going on in the agency. Um, System integration, so typically we see that uh, a lot of the child welfare systems that are out there that are now being replaced through the CWIS program uh, don't really support the way that the social workers need to work. Uh, they, t they tend to be very old, uh, antiquated in some cases. They, they require multiple data entry into multiple disconnected systems. All of that amounts to difficulty doing the job, protecting children and protecting and supporting families, and, and reducing the risk. Uh, you know, that, that some things can go wrong. Um, other common challenges that we see in, in this slide is one that we use with all of our clients because it, it, it's not just in government that we see these challenges. We see them in nonprofit world. We see them in, in, in the corporate world as well, as well. So the silos, uh, the silo structure, the silo mindset, that, that tendency to organize and design for 
efficiency uh, within each uh, particular function as opposed to a coherent end-to-end -end type of system. Uh, the, the difficulty in creating space for changing the way that you work. If you have uh, a lot going on, if you have all, uh, and all of these things are related, by the way, uh, it's hard to create space when you have uh, too much work in process. Uh, there are too many things going on, and typically when you have too much work in process, you're doing a lot of firefighting, uh, potentially caused by dependencies and other things. All of these things are interacting together to make it difficult uh, not only to collaborate, work together, uh, to keep your eyes on the prize and the ultimate goal and to deliver effectively, uh, but, you know, but, but to just get through uh, the day and manage and manage all of the different things that are going on. We talk about creating space in the context of uh, collaboration because in order to collaborate, you have to uh, make space for that. And, and in typically in the Agile model, uh, where it shows uh, up at, at, in the beginning is uh, <clears throat> when we ask the business business to spend more time in ongoing collaboration with IT. When IT reaches out to the business and says, hey, we really want to collaborate with you. We want to move away from a big upfront planning model. We want to shorten our cycles a bit. We want to be able to validate with you that we're building the right things. You immediately see a space problem there, and that is availability, both of the subject matter experts that are in, in, in the office itself and those out in the field. It's hard uh, with those resource constraints to find that space to collaborate. It's a major challenge. Uh, we talk about recurring patterns of function and dysfunction. Uh, typically, when you see systems being built, there's a pattern where large sets of requirements documents are put together, the system is rolled out, and we find out that it doesn't work uh, as designed. There are also other recurring patterns that we see within, within government where, uh, you know, the, the approval process uh, for certain types of things happens downstream and it always tends to send things back upstream again and these things recur over and over again. Uh, when we talk about increasing collaboration, we often stress the fact that it's important for a consistent uh, management support and engagement and if you don't have, con if that is inconsistent, it sends a mixed message, makes it very difficult uh, to actually increase that collaboration, the type and the uh, frequency of collaboration. And then at the end of the day, end-to-end -end ownership. Related to silos, uh, you know, we want to uh, build a system and work within a system that where each of the different pieces and parts are designed to work together uh, seamlessly uh, and that we're, we're, we're opening up those silos and creating opportunities for increased collaboration. So we live in the age of change. Everyone knows that. The thing is that a lot of the factors that we see now, uh, environments are changing, technology is changing, uh, the way that demands are placed on uh, government agencies is changing. Uh, they can come from both internally, externally, they come from legislature, they come from management, they come from uh, the field. Uh, these, these changes are coming all the time. Uh, and, and changes in policy, technology processes, it, it, it's a, a constant flurry of, of change. Uh, and what it requires us to be able to do is, is to respond and flex and adapt, but to do it in a way that has a minimal amount of disruption. And, you know, often uh, what you see in the, the big upfront planning in the traditional project management world is a real constraint on being able to deal with change. Uh, you, you typically are laying out your, uh, your scope, your schedule, uh, and all of those things up front, and you're trying to reduce or eliminate uh, changes to that scope and that plan once you've set it. Uh, that works in some areas, but in, in, in systems development and product development, it, it tends to be uh, very constrained. So there are ways within uh, a more waterfall uh, process to uh, shorten your cycles, to make opportunities uh, to deal with change in a different way. Uh, the way that you specify your requirements and the level of detail uh, can change. You don't necessarily have to go to a full agile model in order to uh, increase your ability to deal with change. 
Uh, we do have to recognize that change is going to happen, and uh, it's, it's something that you, you want to be able to respond to seamlessly. So what are the trends that we see in, in, in government? Well, as a, in general, we're seeing that these agile principles, these practices, these shared risk models are actually uh, gaining ground, both at the federal uh, and the state level. Uh, we, as, as technical assistants, uh, actually help several states uh, develop uh, a more agile uh, way of, of procuring and, and managing vendors. Uh, running RFIs, RFPs, writing contracts that were more based on uh, performance than a deliverable, uh, keep holding owner, keeping ownership of, of your product, uh, and focusing on, on that user value. So we're moving away from a systems definition of what it is that we're doing to more of a user-focused uh, 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 requirements process and delivery process. And so the goal is ultimately – business agility and the, the, the challenges, as I've said, are initially uh, when these things start in IT, uh, helping the business side understand uh, the benefits of this, helping the business understand the new role, uh, finding the space to, to work with uh, the product owners on the program side, uh, to get the input from the actual uh, social workers in the field, and all of these other areas and everyone else who is a stakeholder on an ongoing basis. But we are finding this is, this is actually happening in a big way across government, and we've seen states actually show some tremendous uh, improvements in their delivery capabilities and in their, their collaboration uh, between, the, you know, IT and program, but also uh, with uh, all of their other stakeholders involved. That's all I have, Nathan. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Michael. All right. So um, the next section is going to really be focused around uh, collaboration and feedback loops. Um, so first off, leading off here, um, what causes communication breakdowns? And so Michael uh, alluded to a lot of these things, but uh, just some of the things that we've noticed are departmental silos, right? So when we're when we're too focused on our own work and and, and um, we, we're not working collaboratively across the different uh, pieces of the organization. Um, oftentimes, that can actually lead to a lack of understanding, right? And so this is one of the main um, pieces of feedback that we get when we visit states is that, hey, um, the business doesn't necessarily understand our way of working. And oftentimes, I, I ask the question of the IT groups that we're meeting with, um, do we have a sufficient understanding of, of business processes? And, and sometimes the answer is yes, and, and sometimes the answer is no, right? But we want to make sure that we have um, a, a good understanding across the board of, of business processes. Um, we also want to make sure that we have a, a good interaction platform. So if we don't have the right platform to interact, right, and, and we don't have our interaction um, model set up in the right way, um, oftentimes it can be confusing around where, where you're supposed to go to, what you're supposed to do. Um, when you encounter those complex business issues. Um, conflicting, conflicting objectives and, and interests, right? So um, oftentimes, especially when we're visiting the states, we, we hear about um, conflicting objectives and interests. Um, oftentimes, they have to do with the constantly changing environment, but they also may have to do with the fact that um, the business side of, of a, a particular state may be asked to focus on a certain area um, whereas IT might be asked to focus on another. And, and all, you know, all the time, whether we're working in the private or public sector, we want to make sure that we're on the same page um, across the board with, with everybody and that our objectives are aligned um, to the strategic vision of, of, of the organization. Um, so confusing or complex feedback loops, we talked about this a little bit, but we want to make sure that our, our feedback loops are very, very clear um, and that everybody understands their role within, within that. Uh, one of the things that we're going to talk about as we go on here is um, how the business side of the interaction changes um, when when organizations move in a more agile way of working, um, when they move in that direction. And um, oftentimes, we, we one of our, our main pieces of feedback when we go into states is that we really were hoping for you know high levels of, of business uh, involvement because when we make this type of change, 
it's not it's not solely for IT groups, right? This is a change that is really going to affect our way of working across the board. Uh, so interaction models. When, when we're thinking about designing our interaction model, um, we want to design platforms that allow us to communicate frequently, right? This is going to lead us to being able to resolve issues quickly. Um, and obviously, we, we want to um, utilize both formal and informal uh, channels wherever we can. So, you know, we don't want to wait for uh, a formalized meeting to get an answer um, if that's going to mean it's going to slow down our business process, right? So we want to communicate frequently. Um, we want to ensure the right audience is there, right? So are we communicating with the right people? Um, do, do we have the right people at the table to be able to get the answers that we need to solve this complex business problem, right? And that's really what it's all about. Oftentimes, um, when we hear about organizations that are having low cohesion, um, it's because decisions are being made um, without the presence of, of all groups involved, um, and obviously that can go to create some friction. Um, so the, the other part here is we want to be very, very specific about um, what we need to accomplish and why, right? And so when we're meeting with teams, um, we want to make sure that we're being both efficient and effective. And so going into meetings, and or whether it's a, a formalized meeting or just an interaction, uh, making sure that we know what we need to accomplish out of that meeting or interaction and, and why we're going there in the first place um, is hugely important when we think about um, designing our interaction models. So continuous improvement and, and communication. Um, one of the big things that you're going to want to start thinking about when, when we start thinking about improving our, our collaboration and communication model is how we can incorporate continuous improvement, right? So, you know, we're not going to be able to get to a place where our collaboration model is perfect tomorrow, um, but we can get to a place where we can get together and start talking about what went well and what didn't go well so that we can start adapting those things. So the three main areas that you're really going to want to focus in on here are, are feedback, right? Uh, are we having the right conversations? Um, efficiency, are we examining our processes and results with the right stakeholders? And evolution, um, how can we adapt our system of delivery to make sure that we're getting optimal value for, for the organization? Um, so when we're thinking about our, our interaction model, um, we want to make sure that, you know, we're, we're um, thinking about these three things. Are we, are we getting the right feedback? Are we involving the right people? Are we being efficient in, in, through this process? And do we have a platform and do we have a process to evolve and get better over time? So a couple of tools and techniques for collaboration. Um, I wanted to include this in here uh, because these are these are great things to for you know anyone on this call if you want to learn a little bit more about any of these tools or, or techniques. There's a lot of information out there on the web, but uh, a few that I really wanted to hone in on are um, real-time collaboration tools. So um, you know Jim had mentioned that it's it's often great to get in in the room with folks, but when you can't, um, having those types of real-time collaboration tools, whether it be um, video chat or whether it be, you know, Google Docs, um, some type of, of tool or platform to be able to collaborate and um, be able to put heads together and, and get to um, the solution. The whole idea here, um, taking a break from tools and technology, but um, the whole idea here is that, you know, uh, no one, one of us is as smart as all of us. And so the more that we can collaborate and the more that we can put our ideas together, the better off we're going to be as an organization. Um, so some other tools that we can use um, in, in Agile, visual boards and backlogs are, are a huge piece of why Agile is so effective from a communication and collaboration perspective. Visual boards allow um, the business or even folks operating within the technology team to be able to see what's actively being worked on, to be able to identify um, impediments or buildups in the process. Um, and from a backlog perspective, this is really where you gain um, visibility into what's upcoming for a technology group, what type of uh, business value they're planning on putting out. Um, and from a prioritization perspective, um, having a backlog that's managed by um, someone who can help define business value goes a long way in interacting with different business stakeholders. Um, a couple techniques that I wanted to talk through, um, stand-up meetings. So stand-up meetings are, again, a, a uh, kind of a principle that kind of originated out of Agile, right? But um, stand-up meetings are basically a meeting where we get together um, either uh, daily or, you know, as frequently as we can um, to get together and talk about our goals and, and reposition ourselves to, to meet those goals, 
right? So it's not a stat status meeting. Uh, it's a meeting for us to hop in a room and talk about what our goals were for a particular iteration and reposition ourselves so that we can achieve those goals based on the change that has happened since we originally committed to achieving those goals. Um, the other one that, that I, I really wanted to talk about is, is cross-training, right? So I talked about earlier that we really want to make sure that we're on the same page with um, folks on, in, within different departments um, and, and having an understanding of what their business as usual or day-to-day -day looks like can go a long way within that context. Um, and so oftentimes, you know, whether or not cross-training um, has relevance to a productivity perspective, oftentimes from a communication, collaboration, and business relationship perspective, um, it can go to add a lot of value. So with that, we're going to move into Agile and collaboration. Um, so the reason that we wanted to talk about Agile is um, Agile can, it, it really does uh, lend itself to improved uh, levels of communication and collaboration organizationally, right? And so, you know, one of the things we want to talk about through this slide is, is how can Agile help us communicate and, and collaborate more effectively? Uh, so Agile is going to give us improved flexibility and responsiveness. Right? So because we're um, continually welcoming change and continually incorporating that change into our future plans, um, it really allows us to uh, get that improved level of flexibility. Also, you know, as I mentioned, it provides improved visibility for the business. Um, continuous involvement um, is, is one of the big benefits. You know, I think Michael talked about earlier that it is a change in, in how we're going to work and how we allocate our time, right? And, and I think business side of, of uh, organizations oftentimes think that because I'm going to have to be continually involved, that means that I actually need to dedicate, um, you know, increased time. Um, and, and oftentimes it's, it's just thinking about how you're going to be involved um, in it from a different perspective. Um, you know, in the traditional sense, you're involved very heavily in the upfront process and, and, and the end process. Um, but within Agile, again, we're going to be hoping to get that more continuous involvement so that we can incorporate your feedback into our future plans for, for that project or product. Um, you know, Michael talked about taking a user-centric design. is a huge piece of Agile. Um, increased alignment, right? So making sure that um, business priorities and IT priorities um, align and that, and that they're um, in sync, right? So, uh, and then the other piece is it accelerates value production, right? So because we're not waiting to um, have this big bang uh, waterfall uh, release of, of productivity, or uh, I'm sorry, of, of functionality, um, and, and we're hoping to have a much more iterative and incremental release of functionality, we can start getting um, feedback on that, and we can start getting value and incorporating that value into our future plans um, much more early you know, in the process than, you know, that traditional waterfall approach. Um, so with that, I wanted to take a quick second, and we're going to be doing a quick video overview of what Agile is from um, one of our certified Scrum trainers. His name is Dave Pryor. He's very, very well recognized and, and um, respected within the Agile community. Um, and so Dave's going to be leading us through a, a brief overview of what Agile is here. Hi, my name is Dave Pryor. This is going to be a quick overview of Agile. I'm going to talk a little bit about the background behind it, some of the history of Agile, some core ideas that are centered to making it work. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about how it's different from a more traditional approach and some of the changes you should expect if you're moving towards a more Agile approach to getting your work done. When people talk about Agile, a lot of them are under the mistaken impression that it's something that's fairly recent. Now, the Agile Manifesto itself was written in 2001, but the practices, as you can see on the screen, the practices behind it go back much further than that. And when we talk about Agile, Agile is not something that you do. Agile is more a core set of beliefs, and there are many different practices that fall underneath that umbrella. That's how a lot of people like to talk about it, like a big umbrella. Um, some of the things that fall under the umbrella that you might be familiar with are things like Scrum, Kanban, Extreme Programming. Those are all different ways of doing Agile. And there's lots of practices that go along with that as well. There's things like test-driven development and mob programming and story mapping. And those are all approaches to work that are in sync with an Agile approach to getting stuff done. And Agile is also not something that's limited to software. It, it may have begun there, but 
all these different practices that we use have extended far beyond that. And you'll find as many uses of Agile outside of technology as you do in technology. But there are some basic common ideas behind it, and that's the thing I want to talk about now. If you think about a traditional approach to project management, something like Waterfall, which you can see here on the screen under the defined and linear approach, that approach was defined uh, officially in 1970 by a guy named Winston Royce, where he laid out the different steps that were involved in traditional project management. And one of the things that Winston Royce was trying to get across in that paper was that if the thing that you're working on is very repeatable, if you totally understand it, if it's something that doesn't bring a lot of change and doesn't include a lot of risk, this is a fine approach to work and we can basically manage risk through control. But if you work in a field where we're constantly uh, exploring new things and testing new things out, trying to actually understand our problem a little bit differently than, than we did yesterday and get a better understanding of what the best solution for that problem is, then you're probably following something that's a little more empirical and a little more iterative. So in an agile way of working, which is empirical and iterative, Every time we go around the loop, we're trying to build on what we've done previously. So we take the knowledge, we take the output, and we make them better, we make them stronger than they were before. In a defined approach, you try to figure out everything you're going to do up front and hope that you get that at the end. In an agile approach, what we do is we just deliver much smaller pieces. So we place smaller bets, and each time we place a bet, we take a look at the work and see how it is and see if we need to change it and make it better. And that's how we get to a better understanding of value, because we're always learning, we're always inspecting and adapting as we go. Another big change in moving from a more traditional approach to an agile approach is the shift from focusing on output to the focus on outcome. So in something like the Ford factory, which is where a lot of the measurements that we use of, of how people work, a lot of the stuff that came out of Frederick Taylor's efforts when he was at Ford, that's what people are still using today, which is very unfortunate because somebody working on a factory line is very different than a knowledge worker we have working today. If someone's working on a factory line, we can try to increase their efficiency, try to increase the throughput, because the idea is that the more stuff that comes out of the factory, the better off we're going to be. But knowledge work isn't like that. And for us, if you're working in an agile way, you're much more focused on outcome. So we don't really want to worry as much about how many hours people are working as we want to worry about what those hours of work produce. Right? So do we have something we can actually learn from, something we can take to a customer, something we can show to them and say, does this provide you with the value that you were looking for? Because that, going back to that empirical approach, that's what helps us learn and get better. And that's what we're constantly trying to do in this way of working. So you'll hear agile people say this all the time, but it's about outcomes, not about output. So the term Agile, where that actually comes from, is something that happened in 2001. So in February of 2001, 17 really smart guys who had all come up with a lot of different approaches to work, all meant to kind of heal some of the, some of the trouble that Waterfall had brought us. They got together in Snowbird, Utah, and they spent the weekend together trying to come up with a way to kind of rally together and fight these battles collectively instead of separately. And they came up with the Agile Manifesto, and that's what you can see on the screen here. So I'm just going to walk through these one by one. So the first line, individuals and interaction over processes and tools. What that's pointing at is the fact that processes and tools are important, but the guys who wrote this found that if they spent time focusing on how people are interacting and help them learn to communicate better, that that would produce better results. And we also have documentation. Documentation is really important, but if you're just doing that documentation because you've always done it, that's not a good reason. And we would never want to create documentation at the expense of a deliverable we could actually give to a customer. We also have contracts. Contracts are absolutely critical. But when I wrote contracts before I started working in Agile, I treated contracts like a shield that I had to use to protect myself from my clients who I looked at like they were the enemy. But if I'm working in Agile, I want to write a contract so that it supports collaboration, so that it helps us learn that we're going to grow together and that what we end up with might not be what we think we're going to end up with when we start. But because we're going to be working so closely together and trust each other, that what we get at the end, that outcome that we're looking for, is going to be the thing that we decide together along the way. And the last line, we absolutely have plans. Plans are critical. But... We never want to follow the plan at the expense of delivering the best possible thing. In a traditional approach, we usually create that plan when we know as little as we're ever going to know, and we spend a lot of time trying to make sure we stick to that plan. But what if the plan's wrong? What if the plan's bad? What if the plan needs to change? 
we would rather just change because that's the smart thing to do. I mean, a lot of Agile really just boils down to common sense. So this is the Agile Manifesto. There's another word on the page I want to highlight before we move on, and that's the third word on the page, uncovering. In an Agile approach, this way of working is constantly evolving and changing. So if you're headed down this path, you should never get expect to get to a point where you're able to say, like, I'm Agile, I'm done, I learned it all. But every single day when you come to work, you will be focused on trying to become more Agile. So we're always just trying to improve how we do this stuff. In the same way that every time we do an iteration, we try to deliver more value, every day we try to get better at how we're working this way. Now, there are a lot of people who take issue with the way the manifesto was originally written, and they'd like to see it changed a little bit. So one way you might think about it is what you can see on this screen here. It's just enough processes and tools to enable individuals and interactions, and just enough documentation to facilitate the delivery of working software or working product that doesn't have to be software. Just enough contract negotiation to allow customer collaboration, and just enough planning to support our ability to respond to change and learn and grow and deliver the most valuable outcome possible. So the Agile Manifesto is core to everything that we do, and there's lots of practices, like I mentioned before, like Scrum and Kanban, Extreme Programming. Those are just different ways of doing this stuff, but all of them are in sync with the Agile Manifesto. So if you're trying to figure out if you're Agile or not, the Agile Manifesto is what to turn to. And if you're trying to figure out if you're Agile enough or not, the answer is always no, because every day you should be trying to get a little bit more Agile than you were the day before. So there's just a few more things I want to go over, and one of them is some of the differences between a traditional approach and an Agile approach. Because if you're moving from one side to the other, you are going to experience a lot of change. In a traditional approach, we have these very long development cycles. Sometimes it's up to a year or two before you get any feedback from a customer at all. And for us, the way that we're working, we keep delivering as frequently as we can. Sometimes as short as a week or two weeks, and sometimes it's reduced to even within a day, a couple times a day. So we're going to keep producing work and asking for feedback. And that feedback is going to help us learn. And that learn is going to drive change. So in an Agile approach, we don't have scope creep. We just have common sense. We learn stuff. We figure out a way to make it better. We make it better. We don't want to fill out a bunch of forms to do that. So whenever we can try to find a way to adjust the process to support and enable change that comes from learning, which helps us get to better outcomes, that's something that we want to do. We also ask a lot more of the people who work this way. So we're looking for cross-functional teams instead of groups that are set up in silos where we've got you know, all the developers and all the QA people and they're separated and they don't really interact much. We want to develop teams of people where we have everybody on the team that we need to take a post-it and turn it into shippable product. So if it was software, that's designed, developed, and testing. But if you think about a restaurant, it would be one team where everybody we need to produce a meal is on that team together. So this is going to present a big change to a lot of companies because they're going to have to restructure how they're set up or at least figure out how to create these teams where we let these people who are going to produce the end product get together, stay together, and make decisions about how to solve the problems together. That's going to mean that they're going to need to have a very clear understanding of what this product is and what it's supposed to be and not just a list of requirements that says it has to do these 176 things. So that's pretty much it. Just a few quick things that I wanted to go over. I do want to wish you luck on your journey here. This is going to be a very challenging and very exciting time for you. Um, moving from Waterfall to Agile is not easy. It takes a lot of work. It demands a lot of people. We all have to kind of rise up to this challenge. Uh, it's very difficult sometimes organizationally if your company is deeply rooted in an old way of working. But there is one thing I'd like to add, something I'd encourage you to pay extra attention to that doesn't show up in the manifesto. Whether you're choosing Scrum or Kanban or whatever, um, a lot of people get really wrapped around the process. And the processes that we follow in Agile, they're very important because they're kind of the things that hold us up. But the bigger challenge that most people go through is the cultural change. And if you're moving from Waterfall over to Agile, there's a big shift in terms of value system and what we look at and what matters to us as individual workers, as well as people in teams, as well as people in organizations. And it's something that, uh, like the Scrum Guide, for example, doesn't spend a lot of, lot of time talking about that. So if you're going to be, in, be successful with this transformation, I'm going to encourage you to spend a lot of extra time just paying attention to that, trying to keep your finger on the pulse of it, seeing when people are getting to a point where they seem to be struggling with it. Maybe not so much the process, but just letting go of the old way of working. That's not an easy thing to do. Um, 
So that's it. I hope you guys have a great time in the rest of the course, and uh, thanks for watching. All right, so that was, uh, again, a video from our certified Scrum trainer, uh, Dave Pryor. Okay, so the next thing that we're going to talk about is, is collaboration and feedback. So traditional methods, um, like David mentioned, pretty long development cycles with little to no uh, feedback before delivery, a lot of upfront involvement, uh, a lot of uh, involvement at the end of the process. But in the middle there, um, you know, we're, we're largely throwing requirements over the wall of the development, and, you know, they're going to run with them for um, an extended period of time. Um, in traditional methods, change is not expected, and it's um, treated as scope creep, and oftentimes it, it is thought of as derailing those upfront plans. Um, and traditional methods uh, usually have matrix project functions, meaning that um, when we're going to put together a project team, we're going to pool individuals from different areas of the organization um, and, and create that project team. In Agile, uh, we have continuous uh, feedback loops that are built into our process, right? And so because we're releasing software much more, uh, or working product much more iteratively, we want to be getting feedback on that, and again, we want to be incorporating that feedback. Um, we treat change as expected, and teams and plans are designed to respond to that change, right? So. We want change, we welcome change, because we want to deliver something that's of mo the most value to the business, right? We may have an idea at the offset of a project of, of what we're looking for at the end, but we're going to learn things as we go throughout that project. And, and it, you know, to Dave's point, it, it's common sense to be able to apply those things towards that end state of the product, right? So we want to be able to incorporate change wherever possible. Um, and, and David also mentioned uh, cross-functional teams, right? So we want to have wherever possible, we want to have the ability to um, take a request and turn that into something that's usable for the business, all within one team. Um, the idea here is that we're going to eliminate as many um, dependencies and, and need to um, wait or reach outside of that group as much as possible um, in the idea that, you know, we, we can put our heads together and, and accomplish this within our, you know, our own space. Um, the actual value proposition, so... The, the real the, the two that I really wanted to focus on here um, is, is visibility and um, adaptability, right? So from a visibility perspective, um, I had mentioned that you know oftentimes the, the traditional project management model will um, have high high visibility in the offset of a project, high high visibility in the end of a project, but in the middle there, it's oftentimes uh, difficult to decipher what's what's really going on. Um, so within Agile, we bridge that by working with the business on a much more continuous and consistent basis. Um, it's not, again, it's not good that it's going to involve uh, higher business involvement, right? It's just much more frequent. Um, so we, we want to be able to get feedback from the business, uh, and we want to create visibility as much as we can for the business, um, one of the major goals in, in going Agile. Um, the other one is adaptability, right? And so I mentioned that we want to be able to adapt over time um, and as you move through a traditional uh, waterfall type project, um, it becomes very, very difficult to adapt once you've locked in that original scope, right? Um, and, and so I mentioned that, you know, oftentimes this methodology treats um, new scope as uh, scope creep, uh, whereas in Agile, we're really going to welcome that and try to apply that as best we can to delivering something of the, the highest value uh, in the end state. Agile's impact on the business. So I'd mentioned earlier that, you know, oftentimes when we, we go and do Agile courses or, or we do an Agile training, um, there will be a lot of techn techn technological presence there, right? But we don't have oftentimes as much business involvement, uh, involvement as we would like. Um, the idea here is that when we're making a change uh, within our technology space on how we deliver any value to the business, we need to be on the same page with the, our, our business uh, counterparts as to how we're delivering that value, right? So if we're going to be making a change and it's going to require changes on their side as well, then we all need to be very, very um, intentional intentional about making that clear, making sure that everybody understands their roles and responsibilities within the context of this new interaction model. Um, so, you know, Agile's impact on the business, more iterative and incremental involvement. They're going to get earlier feedback. It enables change and reduces risk. Um, and, and the big one here is that it really creates um, increased transparency. So Agile and business agility, uh, I just wanted to differentiate Agile and, and business agility really quick. So Agile is a deconstructive approach to project management that's commonly associated with a series of values, 
uh, practices and principles. So within that, um, a lot of the things that we talk about within the context of Agile are tools that you can utilize to create business agility within your organization, right? But Agile is not necessarily the only way to get there. Um, business agility, on, on the contrary, is the ability of an organization to move quickly and easily towards its goals in light of change, right? So as it mentions here on the bottom, Agile is a tool for developing business agility, right? So there may be areas, certain idiosyncrasies of Agile that we can apply to our traditional methodology to be able to deliver more value and be able to uh, increase our ability to move quickly and easily towards our goals in light of change. So collaboration and business agility. Collaboration is super important to being able to develop business agility. Um, we want to be able to accelerate feedback loops. Uh, it, it's going to lead to faster solutioning. Um, it's, it, we want to ensure alignment across objectives and, and create shared responsibility, right? So, you know, if we're thinking about uh, moving easily towards our goals, right? When we're all on the same page about what that goal is, it becomes a lot easier to team up and get there. Um, so we want to also create a platform for managing and responding to change, right? So um, when, we, when we're continually collaborating and, and we have that platform there, when we encounter a tough business um, problem or something that's complex, uh, we know who to go to, we know who to talk to, we have those business relationships built so that we can get that solved uh, rather quickly. Uh, Cross-organizational connection and teamwork uh, lead to improved business solutions, obviously. Uh, we've talked about this a little bit as we've gone throughout the presentation today, but the more that we can put our heads together, uh, the better solutions that we're going to get, uh, you know, in the end state. Uh, we want to create shared responsibility as well, right? So one of the big things that Jim's going to talk about here is, in a second is that if we want to create some business agility as an organization, that's a business problem to solve. And, and we all have shared responsibility in doing that, right? So oftentimes I hear um, when I meet with business folks that, hey, you know, the IT group's not delivering, upon, you know, uh, what I'm, I'm hoping for, or they're, you know, they're not coming through for me. Um, and, I, and I ask them about responsibility, right? Because we all have responsibility in making sure that um, we're delivering value for the organization, and we all have to partner in delivering that value. Um, and this last one here is, is enabling quick and easy movement towards goals, right? So when we're collaborating and we're putting our heads together and we know who to talk to, we're not sitting around and fumbling and, and trying to figure out what to do, right? We know what to do so we can quickly and easily do that and, and move on to the next thing um, in the name of getting towards our goals. So a couple keys to collaborating for business agility. Um, I'm just going to roll through these real quick here because we're, we're a little bit crunched for time, but um, outcomes over outputs. Integrated business, integrate business knowledge with technical expertise. Uh, we want to remove barriers and dependencies wherever possible. We want to collaborate early and often, as I mentioned, through both formal and informal channels. Um, we want to uh, collaborate. We want to integrate collaboration into our business as usual, right? So we want to talk with our managers and, and the folks who are helping to lead our organizations around, hey, if we're going to be collaborating, how does this change my role? What does that do to my responsibilities? What does that do to my time allocation, right? All considerations that we need to think about. Um, measure what matters, right? So uh, we, need to, we need to make sure that we're holding each other accountable. And to do that, oftentimes we need to create metrics and, and some measurements to be able to uh, be on the same page with everybody. And, you know, the big piece here that I talked about earlier is we want to adapt and evolve continuously. So uh, with that, I'm going to be handing it over to, again, Jim, who's going to be taking us through business agility in the larger organization. Okay. Thank you, Nathan. So what I want to do is um, I want to allow plenty of time for q and I know there are a lot of questions that are already queued up, and I want to let, allow time for that to happen. So I'm going to give you a few affirmations, things that uh, absolutely you should take away from today. You've heard a lot in the last hour, uh, a, a lot of content, a lot of information. Um, so a few affirmations. Uh, the full benefits of Agile cannot be achieved without engaging with business leaders management, and your end users. Not just engaging, but collaborating with the business leaders, management, and end users. These are business problems to solve. They're not technology problems or tooling problems. We address these problems through systems and processes and look for process improvements, and we're doing this to get better outcomes. So again, it's Engaging with the business, 
collaborating with management, end users, leadership. It's helping your leaders to understand this is a business problem to, un- to, to solve. And if your leader's on this call, understand this is a business problem to solve. This is not technology or tooling. Agile is a strategic requirement. It's not a tactical option. So when you look at the various stakeholders that are involved, all of them need a a seat at the table. Business groups, technology, senior leadership, procurement. If you have a project management office or whatever that portfolio level is, they all need a seat at the table. In particular, IT is not a tool. IT is a strategic partner and they need to be part of the strategic conversations. For Agile to work, to be effective, to get the type of outcomes that you want to get from working in this way, all of these entities need to be part of the strategic planning process. So we're talking about who's involved with Agile. It's really focusing to organize around the work to the highest extent possible, do this in small teams, Provide a clear line of sight to leadership, management, the end users. Make sure you collaborate. Make sure you communicate. Organize around the work and provide a clear line of sight to leadership, management, and the end users. Ask yourself these questions. Who is checking to make certain the highest priority work is getting done? How are you communicating progress? What does success look like? How are you collaborating at a strategic level and who's sitting at the table having those conversations. All of those things are an important part of understanding business agility and moving to more effective, productive, outcomes-based way of working. So I'm going to turn it back over to our moderator and allow the last 20 minutes for Q&A. Nick? Hello there, everyone. This is Nick. Operator, would you please remind folks how they can uh, ask questions over the phone? I sure can. For those of you on the phone lines who would like to ask a question, please press star followed by one. Please ensure your phone is unmuted and record your name clearly when prompted. Again, that is star followed by one. One moment while we wait for questions. Thank you. And as a reminder for folks, if you have any questions for our uh, experts here, please type them into the chat box. I did have a question for all of you as we wait for additional questions to come in. What recommendations do you have for the IT team to engage business, especially product owners and sponsors, to implement the IT system successfully? Sure, Nick, I'll take this. This is Nathan. Um, So, you know, when we're thinking about working with uh, business groups or or business groups working with IT groups, we always want to have um, a working agreement we want to have a common understanding of, of the roles and responsibilities that everybody needs to play within the, the uh, context of, of that relationship. Um, and we want to have a very clear understanding of, of um, what we're there to do, right? So when we're, you know, I mentioned this earlier, when we're moving in a, a more agile direction, right, and we're hoping to develop some, some business agility, and with that we may be adopting new practices, um, one of the common failure modes that we see is that technology groups don't get the business on the same page um, with them around those changes, and, and, and that can lead to some friction, right? So making sure that we're all on the same page as to the, the way that we work and, and how we produce value as an organization um, can really go a long way. Michael, Jim, do you guys have anything to, to add to that? Yes, this is Michael. I could say that you know one of the ways that we did it through technical assistance was by creating a forum uh, whereby we could talk about uh, you know what Agile is and develop a shared understanding of how Agile principles and practices could promote the development of higher quality uh, products, uh, you know, and better usability for for the end users and and, and the people in the field. Oftentimes in the IT group, Agile is, is fairly well known. It is somewhat of an unknown on the program side. In addition, as we discussed earlier, there are often constraints around the amount of time that they have 
to actually interact. It's, building the new system is highly important, but so also are those day-to-day -day things that have to be done in order to protect children and families. So uh, with the technical assistance program, what we did, and, and it, it doesn't have to be through technical assistance, but we, we, we initiated a discussion, or we call it an agile level set, and really what, it, what is it? What's involved? What is the program's role in this? What's required of that? And how, how can this better help them uh, serve children and families? And ultimately to uh, the development of a childware information system that reflects how, how the work gets done. Uh, you also have to acknowledge the, the difficulties that uh, may, may arise as a part of this way of working. You have to talk about in a very open way the fact that this does require ongoing collaboration. It will, it will require more uh, ongoing support and discussion and, and between IT and between the program side of the house. But at the end of the day, that shared risk model, that, that uh, orientation around the common goal of, of creating that child welfare information system that uh, actually supports the people in the field and, and, and furthers the goal of, of you know, what child welfare uh, agencies are out there to do uh, can help uh, open up some space uh, for movement. Uh, that being said, it is then, you know, an, a, 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 a situation where you want to maintain continued discussion and have a, a structured approach to how you're going to implement uh, the, the changes to the new way of working. Uh, but it all starts with that initial forum and, and gaining that shared understanding about the basics of the Agile model, uh, how it can promote all of the things that, that everyone really wants at the end of the day uh, to achieve. Yeah, I would, I would just add that oftentimes technology is thought of in terms of execution, and they certainly play a major role in executing on that strategy. If they do not have a seat at the table, uh, again, you're not getting the full benefits of, of working in this way. And, and by seat at the table, they need to be part of those strategy conversations. Thank you so much. Operator, do we have any questions over the phone? At this moment, I show no questions. Again, to ask a question, please press star followed by one and record your name when prompted. One moment while we wait for questions. Thank you. While we wait, I have a question from the chat box. Where can you start to use an agile process when building a CWIS system with so much scope? So so where can you start? Um, so when you're, when you're thinking about going into any type of, of project or, you know, when we're thinking about producing a CWIS system, which is going to turn into a, a product that we're going to need to maintain over time, uh, we want to have a very strategic plan of, of how we're going to get there, right? And, and that may seem counterintuitive to, to those folks on the call that think we don't do planning in Agile. Um, we want to have a, a strategic plan around that product that's very product-driven um, around uh, how we get there. Right? So there may be opportunities for you to incorporate things within the context of Agile like um, uh, minimum viable product. Right? So how can we get the CWIS system, this future CWIS system, into the hands of our users so that we can start collecting feedback, we can start collecting, or we can start using that feedback um, to incorporate into the future value stream for this project. Right? So I would say, uh, whether it's a CWIS system or whatever you're, you're hoping to accomplish, um, you need to have a strong plan. Um, you know, when, when we talk about getting Agile, um, you know, and Dave mentioned this in the video, th there is no kind of um, light switch that we can turn on and, and, and get Agile. Uh, we really just have to take that first step and create a platform to continually improve. And if we have that platform to continually improve and we're having those tough conversations, um, we're, we're going to get there over time. Hey, this is Michael. It, it, it is a huge undertaking, and in, in the CWIS, uh, building out of a new CWIS system is, is, uh, can be pretty daunting. I, my recommendation would be that you uh, work with your, your federal analysts to uh, get some support, uh, engage technical assistance. Uh, but and there are a lot of variables in how the system is going to be built. So depending on uh, your approach, uh, build versus buy, uh, whether you're actually going to uh, build it in-house, 
uh, or you're going to contract out with vendors. Uh, there's a lot of variables there that could uh, impact uh, the way that you work, uh, the way that you develop those those agile principles and, and practices. So you can actually start uh, today uh, by thinking more iteratively and incrementally about that. Uh, but we, we recommend that you get some, some formal training and get some support actually going down this road because it is, uh, there are uh, a lot of ways to go uh, wrong when you're doing this and you really want to get set up for success. And uh, there's no better way to do that than to have some expert help. Uh, this is not something that you want to try to do by, by trial and error, purely trial and error. Uh, so the way that you, I would recommend that you work with your federal analyst if you are actually going to declare CWIS and actually de develop your CWIS uh, system in an agile way, use the resources that, that are available to you and, uh, and, and take advantage of those and make sure that you are thinking holistically and comprehensively about all of the potential impacts to the, the organization, the agency, uh, and and the vendors and partners that you may have uh, when you're actually uh, develop first of all deciding uh, how to develop the system and then in execution. Yeah, and just to, just can't emphasize enough that finding a good strategic partner to come alongside you that's that's uh, been through this before. So this is this approach, this way of working. Uh, it's well documented. There are Harvard Business Review uh, studies, white papers uh, from Forrester and Gartner. Uh, there are uh, proof of concepts around this, even within the public sector. Uh, so there's a lot of information out there, but the highest uh, value uh, recommendation that I can make is, is find a good strategic partner to come alongside you. Uh, I know the federal analysts are trying to make and are making some of those uh, technical assistance resources available to you. So do your due diligence in that regard. And um, it is something that can be planned and it is something that you can do, but I wouldn't recommend that you just try to do this on your own. Thank you very much. Operator, do we have any questions over the phone? I share no questions on the phone lines at this time. Thank you. I have. Uh, so, panelists, I have two questions in the chat box right now just to give you a heads up for time, and I want to leave us about a minute towards the end of the presentation just to wrap things up. So, the next question for you is how can you implement an agile process and keep a waterfall process? Can you do a hybrid? Yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take that one, and then, Michael, I'll throw it to you as well because I, I, both of us have had these conversations that probably – 15, 16 uh, plus different states, you're going to find out in, in most cases, you're going to have a very traditional uh, waterfall technique, uh, maybe around uh, compliance or financials, but there'll probably be uh, a way of working that looks very uh, traditional in its phase gate approach and, 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 um, uh, and the way that it is framed. Um, you'll also probably have some iterative type waterfall approach. Uh, you might also have a very agile scrum combine approach at a, at a delivery level. The, the key consideration with this and how, is how your organization is designed because those various ways of working at a portfolio enterprise level, they're going to converge. And how they converge and how you understand how you're going to measure success, the metrics that are important to you, how you're doing governance, uh, across those various lines of business, how you're structuring your team so they can actually get the work done. All of those components uh, can converge and find coherence at a portfolio or enterprise level, and that's what you'll have to do so that you're still driving to the metrics and still driving to the outcomes that you want. But uh, it's, it's very common for there to be various ways of, um, uh, of working within the delivery system. Michael? Sure, thanks, Jim. Uh, I think that the the essence of the question is that that you know, no no one goes wholesale full scale agile, agile overnight. Uh, what, and as Jim was saying, uh, the way that you work, the way that the the fit 
that you achieve for uh, your goals and how you're going to work in those processes is there is no right or wrong way to do it. Agile is not the end-all, be-all. It's not the goal. Uh, but some of the Agile principles make sense in almost any setting. Uh, working in shorter cycles, for example, you can do that with an Agile model. You can do it within a more traditional or hybrid model. Uh, allowing for uh, verification and validation of that uh, you are on, on course in terms of meeting user needs. You can do that within a traditional model. You can do it within an Agile model. Uh, and simple things that did not come from Agile, which work very well in the traditional world as well, is bringing projects to teams. So uh, keeping teams together and, and, and taking advantage of the synergies that happen when people as a cross-functional team work together over time uh, can be a benefit to you regardless of, of, of what model that you're working is in. So the short answer is it, is it is what is the best fit for your organization, for the people, for the job that you have to do, and it is, it is never productive to get into a discussion on things like, well, is this agile or is this not agile? That's kind of missing the point. So if it's a traditional uh, type of planning process with an iterative and short cycle implementation and that's what works best for you, then work on that model and tweak it and, and uh, you'll, you'll have success with it. Yeah, I think, you know, for me it's not about – um, doing agile, it's about building business agility, right? And there are certain aspects of, of agile as far as practices and, and principles and things like that that we can apply towards building business agility, right? And, and we can apply those both within the context of, of an agile way of working or, or that traditional model. Thank you so much. So uh, it looks like we have time for one final question. I'm going to dive right in. Where is the role of the business analyst in the Agile development process? Well, um, it's a little bit of a nuanced question. Um, you know, in traditional Scrum, um, the business analyst is going to be someone who's supporting uh, the product role, right? So they're going to be supporting um, the, the product owner. But to answer your question in a better way, it, it's really dependent upon the way you organize your organization, right? So do you have a product owner, a dedicated product owner um, is a big consideration in, in what that business analyst is going to look like. Um, do we have cross-functional dedicated teams um, is a big consideration in what that business analyst is going to look like. Um, and so there's there's a couple different nuances there that, that you'll want to consider in, in thinking about that. Um, Jim, Michael, do you guys have anything to add on to that? Sure. So the business analyst is one of those roles that can vary really widely uh, from individual to individual and, and between organizations. So business analysts may be performing uh, some form of project management. Uh, they may be more technically oriented, uh, doing research around, uh, you know, and, and translating business needs into actual technical specifications. Could be more process oriented. Uh, but business analysts are found throughout. Uh, this model. They're found at the strategic level uh, providing decision support to executives who are looking at longer-term initiatives. They're found at the portfolio level uh, starting to translate some of that business knowledge into more uh, risk-based risk, uh, based and, and technology-based information that can support for further delineation and evolution of those requirements. And they're found uh, within the teams as a full, full-time full member of the team, helping write user stories, supporting the product owner. There's a role for business analysts throughout the system, and depending on what your particular area of emphasis is, you may be full-time on a Scrum team. You may be supporting several Scrum teams or Kanban teams. You may be working with program managers or mid-level managers at the portfolio level, or you may be working with executives. And the, the Axe Act, fit and the role depends on how you, you design your system. Yeah. And and I would just add to that, you know, keep in mind that in an agile way of working, you are organizing around the work to be done, not necessarily the uh, the roles. But there is a function uh, for that business analyst and and to, to Michael and Nathan's point, it uh, it could be on that delivery team or scrum team or combine team. 
Uh, it could be at a portfolio level. But think about, uh, think about the work that needs to be done and then organize and define uh, those uh, responsibilities uh, around the particular work and how you're building out those teams. And, and remember that at its core, Agile is cross-functional teams working off a prioritized backlog and producing working-tested product, working-tested consumable product, working-tested software in some short increment of time. That's really what Agile is. Thank you so much. And thank you, everybody, for your participation in this webinar today. I'm now going to uh, send things over to Nathan for a closing statement. Thanks, Nick. Um, I just wanted to thank everybody for their time today. Um, hopefully some of the things that we talked about uh, are things that you can take away and, and start having those conversations within your, your organization. Um, as Michael and Jim had referenced, um, you know, if you're finding that um, communication and collaboration are, uh, is an area that, that you uh, feel that your organization can grow in, um, we encourage you to have, have that conversation with your, your uh, federal analysts. Um, and talk about how things like the technical assistance program uh, might be able to help you. Um, so, again, I, I, I just want to thank everybody for your time, and, um, yep, I appreciate it. So, thanks, Nick. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, for joining us today. This now concludes our webinar. Goodbye. <laughs>